Hello. Great to be, excited to be here again. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen right now and start this slide presentation. And give me a second here. I think you guys can see that, right? Okay. Yes. Good. Let's get started. So I'll speak and I want to go over some main points because this lecture, um, you know, we have to go a little slow during this lecture because I'm asking that people not only learn about nutritional science, but also learn about emotional science because the potent strategy for permanent weight loss is not just about changing the way you eat. It's about changing the way you think and how you think about the world. And I'm gonna link this to marry this, these two thoughts together, hopefully in a cohesive manner, so you understand what I'm asking people to try to achieve when they're trying to modify their diet. And the main thing here, before we get started, the main thing we wanna achieve here is that we recognize that you have to eat healthfully to lose weight. And you have to eat healthfully to be healthy. But we're thrust in a world around us where people are not eating healthy. They're on a, you know, a race to commit suicide with food. And it makes us health nuts feel and get pressure that we're not being socially accepted. We're not, being, we're not getting praised. We're getting ostracized. And we make other people feel uncomfortable. And many people don't like, they want to fit in, they're social animals, and they want to get the approval of others, which further complicates and makes more difficult this changing to a healthy diet, especially the diet as healthful as I recommend. So I'm going to give you these strategies that were important just to be healthy in the modern world and just to have a healthy emotional outlook on life that's going to help you live longer. Because being in great health is not all about food. It's also about our emotions and our feelings as well. So with that as an introduction, let's get started. So getting back to some, just reviewing a few basics before we get into some of the more um, newer concepts is that our long-term health, our healthy life expectancy, our play span and our lifespan is linked to this equation H equals N over C, which means that the, that your body cells need nutrients in the cells. And the concentration of nutrients in the cells determines the health of those cells and the long, longevity of those cells. So if cells are deficient in nutrients, they build up more toxic metabolites. The cell, the nutrients are needed to fuel the cell's self-protective mechanisms that gene silence, which means keep the genes from, keep abnormal genes from being expressed, prevent methylation defects, and prevent the accumulation of toxic or carcinogenic metabolites within the cells and other noxious compounds that age us like free radicals and AGEs or advanced glycation end products. So this first principle of a nutritarian diet says that your health is determined by the micronutrient bang per caloric buck which means we want to eat a diet that has micronutrient adequacy, that has enough micronutrients in it, and not eat empty calorie foods. Because when we eat foods that have no nutrients, like white bread and flour and cookies and crackers and you know, breakfast bars and chips and soft drinks and muffins, and you know, we eat these foods that they we don't our cells do not have enough of these antioxidants and phytochemicals and just plain vitamins and minerals that they need. And I'm also suggesting here that a piece of chicken is like a bagel because both the animal product and the processed carbohydrate food is low in micronutrients. They don't contain a, a high dose of vitamins, minerals, but mostly missing is the phytochemicals and antioxidants that we need the constant exposure to. We need constant exposure to antioxidants and phytochemicals to keep our brain and our body functioning normally. Now, one of the worst things that drives overeating behaviors, or you could say the primary, one of the major primary factors driving overeating is this concept that I call the caloric rush. That means just like the glycemic load, it means how many calories enter the bloodstreams quickly. So the prototypes I'm talking about are white flour and sugar and oil. 
because white flour is a sugar equivalent. We're going to learn there's, a, there's no difference between white flour and sugar because it, it enters the bloodstream as a rush of sugar. So it's a highly addictive substance. Oil also enters the bloodstream very rapidly. That doesn't, it doesn't matter what kind of oil, avocado oil, flaxseed oil, coconut oil, olive oil, because it's not the, because the fat is not bound to the fiber in the food and it's squeezed out of the food and extracted usually with toxic aldehydes and chemicals to get all the fats out of those fibers, then the oil goes into the bloodstream very rapidly. In a natural world where humans lived 100,000, 50,000, 30,000, even 10,000 years ago, right? It's only a few thousand years people have been extracting oil from food. But the human body is not designed for that. I mean, we have oil because of the rapid, the rapid calories in the blood. In a natural world, in a primitive world, we could have never gotten all those calorie, fat calories in the blood. If you're eating nuts and seeds as a source of fat, they're slowly released from the fibers the sterols and stanols that are bind to the fat. And as the that's they're digested over hours, these fats slowly seep into the bloodstream at one calorie a minute, maybe even one and a half calories a minute, as opposed to oil, which all rushes in within the first few minutes. They say when you put oil on your food, from the lips to the hips in five minutes flat, all the oil's coming in. When, when calories rush into the bloodstream, the body has to rev up storage, try to get it out of the bloodstream fast, has to get the glucose out of the bloodstream, has to get the oil, the fat out of the bloodstream, and the body secretes more insulin and other fat storage hormones that push these calories into the fat supply. You can't burn it for energy because you're not burning energy that quickly. But what I'm, the reason I'm bringing this up right now and right at the beginning is because it's not just about pushing up fat storage. It about, about this, this high rush of calories in the blood stimulates the brain. And it stimulates the brain just like a narcotic does in the open opiate centers of the brain, over time making us dopamine insensitive. So we start, our brain starts to feel flat and unsatisfied unless we try to replicate this caloric rush. And as our brain becomes more st overly stimulated from all the calories entering the bloodstream, we desire more calories stimulating the bloodstream. It's like we're shooting up with a narcotic like heroin, and after a time we get to tolerance to it, we want more heroin, and we want more heroin, and we want more heroin. And we want more oil, and more fried food, and more sugar, and more honey, and more maple syrup, and we want more caloric rush. And we become habituated to, the, to this caloric rush, to this chronic caloric intensity in the blood. And over time, we're not satisfied with the normal meal. You can't have like a, you know, a bean burger and some broccoli and, uh, you know, and some with tomato sauce on it and a piece of fruit for dessert. That won't satisfy you. Where's the cheesecake? Where's the ice cream? Where's the chocolate bar? Where's the French fries? Where's the soda? You've got to have something oily, greasy, sugary. You've got to get that caloric rush or you feel empty from that meal. So we train our children to be little food addicts. So they're not satisfied with normal food. They have to have this hyper palatable, intense food. That for, so we start to build drug addictive, you know, food food like drug addictive um, eating habits. So the person could say, "Oh, if I had to eat like that, I'd rather be dead." You know, like if, who's going to just shoot me right now, kill me right now? I who wants to? Because their whole life revolves around this drug like addictive relationship with food and their life is very imbalanced because they have no passion about living, about their humanity and about their ability to like the outside world become, they become more narcissistically consumed with their own need for meeting, for achieving this high stimulatory relationship with food, this caloric rush. Of course, I'm saying beans and nuts are the prototype of slow foods because beans are a high carbohydrate food like white flour is, but they take hours to go into your bloodstream, right? One or two calories a minute. Nuts have the fat and protein like, like oil, but, and as you add oil to the food, don't forget, you're, deleting, you're diluting and removing the protein out of your diet. So if I had, if, if, if I had like, there's, there are five categories of plant foods, right? Intact whole grains, vegetables, legumes, nuts and seeds, and fresh fruit. Those are the five categories. They all contain protein, but one of them doesn't contain much protein. They're all kind of protein adequate, except for one, 
And the one that's not protein adequate is fruit. So we can get our diet to be too low in protein on a plant-based diet if we overdo the fruit and exclude categories of the others or one category or two categories or three categories. We start to just, just mostly. Yeah. So as we narrow the assortment of food types we eat, we narrow the protein bioavailability. But the most powerful way you can reduce the protein on a plant-based diet to an unfavorable level is pouring oil on the food. Because now what are you taking away? What, a quarter of your calories? You're removing the protein from a quarter of your calories. Because you just use protein, you just use um, oil instead of using nuts and seeds as a source of fat. Because nuts and seeds contain protein. So be using 400 calories. And by the way, the average American consumes 400 to 500 calories of oil a day. It's only, it's, it's 120 calories a tablespoon. It's only three tablespoons, right? Three tablespoons, like 400 calories. So we're talking about a few tablespoons of oil. You've just taken... 20 grams of protein out of your diet, where you could have had that fat calories, you could have had those calories from beans or nuts. Okay, so we're saying here that this disruption of normal appetite, the appetite in your digestive tract and the apostat in your central nervous system, the hypothalamus. And these calorically dense foods that rush into the bloodstream stimulate the brain in the absence of energy requirements, meaning that it doesn't even matter how many calories you consume. Even a small amount of calories from these foods are brain stimulatory, but they drive overeating behavior. And they result in impulsive and compulsive food intake. And the only way to restore normal brain circuitry, I'm saying they change the neurological connections in the brain. And they change the brain structure of neuropeptides and, and, and the actual... Um, neurological function and structure of the brain. And we have to restore normal brain circuitry with long-term, many months of having a low caloric rush foods. Of, you have to get away from those drugs. You have to not snort cocaine and take heroin for months for the brain to reset its circuitry and for the dopamine centers to become more sensitive. And you have to take months of decreasing the caloric rush and getting away from these highly stimulating, high, um, instantaneously flooding the bloodstream with calories foods. And that has to be um, enforced long term for people to benefit to um to start to be comfortable with the right amount of calories. The goal here is for people to desire the right amount of calories and eat instinctually. So the amount of calories you feel like eating is the right amount. That's not going to happen right away unless we take out these hyperstimulating foods, and then you're eventually going to feel comfortable with less calories over time. Now, I'm just reviewing here that sugar and flour are not a food. They act in the brain as a drug. So white flour absorbs so rapidly as sugar in the bloodstream to mimic the excursion of sugar in the bloodstream. So white flour is sugar. It's a sugar equivalent. Now, food contains nutrients that sustain life. But white flour and sugar do not have those nutrients to sustain life. They don't contain a sufficient vitamin and mineral load to sustain life. They don't even have enough vitamins and minerals to, met to metabolize their own energy. In other words, when you turn sugar or flour into energy for the body, they utilize cofactors in the mitochondria, right? In the Krebs cycle, and you know, when we're making energy, we utilize cofactors like vitamins and minerals, but they don't even contain the cofactors that are necessary to convert them, those calories into energy. So it has to strip the body of nutrients. So it's lowering the cellular concentration of nutrients as it's flooding the cells with reactive oxygen species, with free radicals that damage and age the cell. So these are anti-life. They're not foods, they're, what is food spelled backwards? F-O-O-D would be D-O-O-F, doof. I call these foods doof, or you are a doof if you're gonna eat them because you're eating drugs, not food. So they create the disease and they accelerate death and they lead to nutritional starvation and the buildup of metabolic toxins. And now you become a more toxic individual who's aging faster. And now you not only desire more and are habituated to overeating calories, but now if you try not to eat these foods and you cut back on them, you feel wasted, fatigued, shaky, irritable, and even angry.